I want to start with a consideration of our ancient ideas about the relation of the individual to the world in terms of fate and free will or determinism and free will. I'm very, very pragmatic in the way I see my spiritual relationships with things. The first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect. Everybody assumes that it is basic that there's such a thing as cause and effect. Um, in the, to the effect that it's an issue of causality and systemic relationships. I mean, this is so much a fundamental assumption of our world that you seem to be an idiot if you call it in question. Good philosophy is calling in question our basic assumptions. That's bullshit, because actually what we call a cause and what we call an effect are two ways of looking at one and the same event. And there's no way of, of, of thinking about cause and effect that allows us to say that the buck stops here. So when I go about my work, I see it as an issue of what works and what doesn't versus what's right and what's wrong. The, the, the buck never stops. Supposing there's a neurotic, difficult child, and uh, the, one school of thought used to say, well, bang him about, beat him up, and uh, maybe he'll change. But then they said, oh no, that's not fair to the child to beat him up because it was his parents. But the buck never stops. Uh, they didn't bring him up properly. And so then they say, well, punish the parents. But the buck never stops. Well, the parents say, excuse me, but I'm, our parents were neurotic too, and they brought us up badly, so we couldn't help what we did. And so since the grandparents are dead, we can't get at them. And in any case, supposing we could, uh, we would pass the whole blame back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But the buck never stops. And they say, they started all this mess. But then Eve would say, no, the serpent tempted me and I did eat. But the buck never stops. And it was the serpent's fault. And God looked at the serpent. And the serpent didn't make any excuse. He probably winked because the serpent, being an angel, was wise enough to know where the present begins. So you see, if you insist on being moved, being determined by the past, that's your game. But the fact of the matter is, it all starts right now. But we like to establish a connectivity with the past because that gives other people the impression that we're sane. If you didn't pay attention to this detail and that detail, but we're just simply aware of it all in general, you would get the funny feeling in the first place that you were just a puppet, that you were automatically responding to all kinds of physical and social influences around you, and that you couldn't help yourself. Either our wills are determined by prior causes, a long chain of prior causes, and we're not responsible for them, or they're the product of chance, and we're not responsible for them, or there's some combination of chance and determinism. So let us suppose the sun shines and shines and shines so that there is no rain. And we say as the result of there being no rain, there is a drought. And as the result of there being a drought, there is no water to drink, the plants do not grow, and people and animals starve. And that is the consequence of the drought and of there being no rain. Well, all that is nonsense because the lack of rain, the lack of water, and the starvation are simply all the same event, only they are separated into parts for purposes of description. Perpetual sunshine, no rain, drought, lack of water, lack of food, starvation, these are all names for different aspects of one and the same event. But no combination seems to give you the free will that people cherish. You might object to that, or you might alternatively enjoy it. You might get a sensation that you were just floating. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to think about any problem. You didn't have to worry about what you ought to do. You would just feel yourself responding. And that would be a very pleasant feeling if you liked it. But on the other hand, depending on your personal constitution, you might feel terribly threatened by it. And you would interpret this sensation as a feeling of unreality. So what, what does it mean to say that this murderer committed his crime of his own free will? If this statement means anything, it must mean that he could have behaved differently. He could have resisted the impulse to commit the murder, or he could have declined to feel the impulse altogether. And, and not on the basis of some random influences over which he had no conscious control, but, but because he was actually the, the conscious author of his thoughts and actions. In fact, in terms of human nature, in terms of human behavior, I think the greatest failure is people are so inclined, they're so individualist, individualistically oriented that narcissism is so deeply bred that they have a terrible time thinking that somehow they're not in control of their lives. And at the moment, the only philosophically respectable way to defend free will is to adopt a view in academic philosophy that's called compatibilism and to argue that free will is compatible with the truth of determinism. Dan, if I were to believe in materialism, physicalism, that everything in my mind is my brain and everything is determined in a physical world, how then can I have 
free will. Now, my, my friend Dan Dennett is a uh, the philosopher is a, is a compatibilist, and he essentially makes the claim that we just have to think about free will differently. Free will is a is a biological level phenomenon. It's not a physical level phenomenon. If a murderer commits his crime based on his desire to kill, and not based on some other thing that's hijacking him, but his actions are actually an expression of his real desires and intentions, well, then that's all the free will you need. We are freer than our parts. Our parts don't have free will, but we do. Now, how could that possibly be? Without adding something extra. Without adding anything mysterious. So we have to make free will compatible with determinism. We're not going to say that our, our actions aren't determined, but we're going to show that they're not inevitable. I mean, I actually said in the, in the discussion, if my future is determined, then it's inevitable. Why are we all in this auditorium? We were just sort of predestined by the universe to be in this auditorium at a certain time. Like, What on earth does that mean? Do you, right. do you f feel fulfilled by that? If so, you really have no choice in the matter. That's true. Yeah. Uh -huh. You can't change the future either. From what to what? I mean, <laughs> the future is what happens next. If we want to get clear on this, we have to see what inevitable means. It means unavoidable. So then we have to get clear about what avoiding is. And then we can begin to see the biological dimension. But what you can do is change what you thought the future was going to be into something else. And this is the key to avoiding. Here's my problem. I see at the physics level this absolute determinism sure. of Determin particle yep. and particle from way back. Now at the biological level, we're talking about avoidance. So how does the avoidance help us to avoid the determinism? Because it is determined. So what does the word <laughs> inevitable add? But from both a, a moral and scientific point of view, this seems to miss the point. What's happened on this planet over the last four billion years has been an explosion of avoiding Avoiding dissolution, avoiding being eaten, avoiding starving to death. And there's been an arms race, and the avoiders have become cleverer and cleverer and cleverer. And how do you avoid something? You avoid something by anticipating it and then taking corrective measures. Right. Simplest case, incoming brick. You see it, you <laughs> duck, you avoid it. Well, you see, I avoided that incoming brick. Well, was it ever really going to hit you? No, because <laughs> the light bounced off the brick into your eyes. You saw it you, in time so that you ducked. So suppose you were determined to duck. Well, then the brick was never going to hit you, was it? It just seemed as if it was going to hit you. What we have to understand is that free will is our capacity to see probable futures, futures that seem like they're going to happen in time to take steps so that something else happens instead. When the truth is, scientifically, we're not. We're partially in control of our lives. The voluntary what we do, the involuntary uh, what we have to accept passive. The borderline between them is not at all clear. Breathing, for example. Your lungs are two spongy organs in your chest. The lung is divided into two lobes or sections, and the right lung has three lobes. Uh, is something we have to go on doing, and yet you can acquire the sensation that you are doing the breathing and controlling it according to your will. When you breathe in, air enters your nose or mouth and passes into your trachea or windpipe. It's a very vague distinction here. But if uh, you took in all the information... But where is the freedom in doing what one wants? At the carina, the trachea divides into bronchi, then branches into smaller bronchioles. The bronchioles enter into tiny air sacs called alveoli. See, you, you can feel yourself making a decision out of the blue. You say, I'm going to do that, like that, you see. When, one, when one's desires are the product of prior events. And you don't have any awareness of anything that leads up to it. It just happens, you see. And because that awareness is screened out, you interpret this act of making a decision as a different kind of act from breathing or from growing hair. That one is completely unaware of and had no hand in creating. We are a part of a large, massive integration of viable systems that started from the Big Bang and has been expanding through entropy, and we are in the midst of this at all times, scientifically proven. And if you think that way, if you can try to realize that paradox, it creates an amazing uh, freedom. The point being, then, that there is just the one uh, process which is equally the behavior of the organism and the behavior of the environment. No one has been able to describe a way in which mental and physical events could arise that would make sense of this claim of freedom. Well, actually, it isn't different, but we think it's different because of unawareness. Uh, when you make a decision, it happens, as the Chinese say, uh, 
Zuran, Shizen, uh, of itself, uh, naturally, spontaneously. But we feel that there are things that happen of themselves in contrast to certain things that I do, and that is because of incomplete awareness. But then, if that awareness were to change, and you were to realize that everything is happening of itself, including your decisions, because of your background, you would then veer over to the opposite point of view, everything is happening involuntarily. It creates an amazing sense of compassion, because when you see a mass murder, or you see someone beating their wife or something, you really want to judge them. You really want, but you have to say, what, what are the other elements that happen here? And, and to say that he would have done otherwise, or could have done otherwise, had he chosen to, is, is simply to say he would have lived in a different universe had he been in a different universe. And I am left out. I'm a puppet. I simply have to obey, you see? But this would be incorrect. The point is rather this. We don't have a system of nature which is either deterministic or voluntaristic. The relationship of the individual to the environment is not one of a the individual as some little thing in the environment which is moved by the environment and responds to the environment passively. Nor, oppositely, do we have a situation in which the individual is a center of activity that all of its own, to some extent, alters and changes the environment. The values, the virtues which they have achieved in their own character, you don't love causelessly. You don't love everybody indiscriminately. You love only and then, those who deserve it. And then if a man is weak or a woman is weak, then she is beyond, he is beyond love? He certainly does not deserve it. He certainly is beyond. He can always correct it. Man has free will. If Both of these opinions are based on lack of awareness or ignorance. Ignorance. That the behavior of the individual and the behavior of the environment are the same process. And you can look at the process from two points of view. Now, as sickening as I might find such a person's behavior, I have to admit that if I were to trade places with him, Adam for Adam, I would be him. You can look at it from the point of view of it's all happening to me, or you can look at it from the point of view, um, I'm doing it. These are just two poles of two ways of looking at the same thing. If, for example, you realize that your neurological organization is creating the external world, you are no more responsible for the, the microstructure of your brain at this moment than you are for your height. In other words, there is no such thing as light, weight, heat, uh, color, shape, except in terms of the human nervous system or any some other animal nervous system. Then from that point of view, you can see your nervous system as evoking the whole universe. So, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. One has to be very unlucky to have the mind and brain of a psychopath. Very rarely, very rarely, do really aberrant behaviors come from people that are just normal. Now, but, the, but the significance of luck is very difficult to admit because it seems to totally destabilize our sense of, of morality. But you can take an opposite point of view, which is equally true, which is that the human nervous system is something in the external world. There's, there's always a life experience or there's some kind of serious biological flaw, an injury. And is entirely dependent on uh, sun and air and light and temperature and so on and so forth. Both points of view are true. And yet in specific circumstances, it's, it's very easy to admit. So if you imagine this murderer was discovered to have a brain tumor. Like in the book, I use the example, and I'm sorry if I'm deviating slightly, of the okay. in individual that shot those folks in the 1970s. In, in the appropriate spot in his brain that would explain his violent impulses. He's one of the first mass murderers. If it wasn't a temptation, he, wrote, he said, well have, he have killed his it. mother and, and his wife, and then he shot a bunch of people from no the tower at the University of Texas, if I remember correctly. I, I might be wrong. Okay. So, and he wrote in his diary, he wrote, he wrote a big note, I think it was, not his diary, that I want to have an autopsy after I kill myself because I've been having violent thoughts that came out of nowhere, and I don't, this isn't me. And it's like something just took control of him. But we have not yet, uh, especially in the West, become aware of a logic which can integrate them. Well, then that is obviously exculpatory. Then he's just a victim, or we view him as a victim of biology. And so when we first come to experience this thing as being so, we, we tend to interpret it in terms of our old logics and our old ways of thinking. And I think that doesn't, isn't given the gravity in terms of our sense of compassion and hence understanding. And our moral intuitions shift automatically. But I would argue that a, a brain tumor is just a special case of physical events giving rise to thoughts and actions. 
I think in the book you said that there was actually some kind of problem with his brain. Yeah, there was. He, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. There, he, had a, he had a tumor in his amygdala. <laughs> so there really, really was something pushing on a part of his brain that was causing negative reactions. Okay, and, and if we fully understood the neurophysiology of any murderer's brain... So that one person may say on feeling this, I feel as if I'm just floating around, passively responding to the operations of nature. That would be as exculpatory as finding a tumor in it. And another person going to the opposite extreme will interpret this experience as saying, I suddenly realize I've, I'm God. This is me that's doing all this. And I don't mean that in the metaphysical sense. I mean, I'm a part of this, and I have, I have the control on some level to change it because I have to be a part of it, and I have to experience it. If we actually were aware of all the information that is coming to us through our senses, we would have a very curious sensation, which would bug us because we wouldn't be able to find words for it. So when you sit back and you think, okay, who, what am I, spiritually speaking? I am, on some level, an autonomous system, a viable autonomous system. Yet, on another level, I am a product of a larger order culture. On another level, I'm a product of the eon of evolution that has generated my biology. And I'm a product of intermediary things both, well, I'd say that's the long-term view, but intermediary in the sense of short-term that there are things that could happen to me, like I could go outside right now and be violently assaulted, and that would change my behavior most likely for the rest of my life. That I actually govern and control everything that happens. There's very good reason to believe that medically, based on my constitution or anybody's. That kind of complex awareness to me is the most uh, spiritually profound. These are two ways of looking at exactly the same thing. That you can look at this process from many points of view, define it in many ways, but you can't really split it up. And it, it allows for tremendous ponderance, it allows for tremendous, tremendous sense of identity. That's why I can't sit back and watch what's happening in the world, because this is me. And so the, the, the consequence of this, although I'm not going into this at the moment in any full way, is to learn to act and behave in terms of this vision of the world. Not as you're acting upon the world, not as it acting upon you, but as the uh, unfoldment of a process which, as you understand it, you become more intelligent and act more intelligently. Intelligence is a function of the degree to which you realize that your behavior is one with the behavior of the rest of the world. The more you realize that, the more, one would say, you appear to be better in control, although you're not actually controlling. The difficulty, the essential difficulty, that lies in the way of most people seeing this is the fixed notion that the world consists of separate things and separate events. First time they say, well, what's right for you might be wrong for me. But that's, that pres presumes that we are somehow separate. That presumes there isn't some kind of larger architecture that's systemically relating us. And that's a profound spiritual humbling place to be. In fact, in terms of human nature, in terms of human behavior, I think the greatest failure is people are so inclined, they're so individualist, individualistically oriented that narcissism is so deeply bred. And so the fact that it seems to be impossible to build a functioning society, and you have to be a staggeringly cynical person to think that, no, we just have to believe that that's true, even though it's a lie and predicate our cultures on that. I mean, that's... First of all, I don't. I think it's a weak claim. I don't think that it's. It's also not the, the, the rock upon which you want to found your culture. And and in my sense, because I'm an existentialist at heart, is that what you believe is what you act out. I also don't see any evidence whatsoever that a society can exist that functions over any reasonable period of time in any reasonable manner without predicating itself on the belief that people are both capable of free will and that they're responsible. People say, you can't change the past. I, I think that's right. There are varieties of free will, the traditional varieties, which who cares whether we've got them. The varieties that matter, the varieties of free will worth wanting, as I've said, are co perfectly compatible with determinism. Now, do we have to give up something? Yeah, we have to give up some of the ideology about freedom. We also have to give up something, and good riddance to it, about blame and responsibility. That would scare some people. That they have a terrible time thinking that somehow they're not in control of their lives. When the truth is, scientifically, we're not. We're partially in control of our lives. We are a part of a large, massive integration of viable systems. As Taya de Chardin put it. That started from the Big Bang. The only real atom is the universe and has been expanding through entropy, and we are in the midst of this at all times, scientifically proven. 
The only real atom is the universe. The word atom, you see, in Greek is atomos. A, non, tomos, cut. The uncut. It's the same idea as in Lao Tzu. The uncarved block is a great symbol of naturalness. What cannot be further divided? And so de Chardin says it is the universe that is the only real atom. Because if you take anything out of the universe and separate it, you will find it is raveled at all its edges. It is not, in other words, cleanly divisible. But this is something which is left out of our ordinary awareness. And if you think that way, if you can try to realize that paradox, it creates an amazing uh, freedom. Man has free will to the extent that he knows who he is. Not otherwise. 